I know, goals, right? Three mentors. What do I have to do to be resilient in this moment? For me, relationships are the lifeblood of life. And I realized that the things that you tell young people, they're going to really latch on to. Joe Loicano. We now live in a way of like looking over at someone else's plate and seeing what they have and going, mm -hmm. I want that too. Kristen Souden. I think there's something about like living in those little gap moments. And Marcus Anderson. A woman is closest to death when she's bringing in life. So it's like, that's how change is. Like, change will cause me to die sometimes in order for life and new life to happen. This is the last lap. We all feel privileged to do the work that we do because we get to interact with students who literally live the change. Hello, hello, and welcome to the final episode of The Last Lap. I've never felt so many happy and sad things all at once. I'm Mia Brabham, and this is the 10-episode podcast where I interview my favorite, most interesting professors during the last 10 days of my undergrad career, but... This is a very special episode near and dear to my heart because today these are professors. They are my mentors, my, my friends, my life professors that I've met here at GMU. Also, they're just some of the coolest people I know. And I know I say that a lot, but actually we hang out and talk for hours on end. So they're perfect. Um, we're going to talk about dealing with change, being the change, authenticity, friendships, relationships, so much more. I am really excited to have these three here, but first I want to introduce our friends that are joining us, so here we go. First, we have Adrian Carpenter and Maddie Horner, longtime friends. Say what's up. What's up? Say what's up, dude. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, do that again. Sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> dude, so perfect. Oh my gosh. But um, Adrian is Student Alumni Association president mm. and also just fantastic human being. Oh, <laughs> stop. Uh, Maddie Horner just got an internship in Los Angeles, California oh, with the Fine Brothers. Have you seen the React videos? Turn up. Turn up. Turn up. <laughs> so moving on to you three, uh -huh. Julia Cano. You're the SMAD advisor. He's that dude. For it's specific. It has a title. Advising coordinator. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. But also a professor. Like you teach yeah. mm -hmm. in the SMAD department. Yeah. You taught Maddie Horner. That's how they know each other. I tried. I tried. <laughs> 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 it's it's and then Marcus Anderson. Yo, what a do? <laughs> what a do? What a do? A little bit deeper though. <laughs> what what a like what oh. it do? Mortar. Like Mortar. drop the H, drop the H. Like what it do? <laughs> what it do? <laughs> Help! So okay, you got pretty close there. What it what it do, Marcus? <laughs> yeah. Good. I hate myself. <laughs> Marcus Anderson, I worked with you. I'm emotional for three yeah. years wow, at crazy. career and academic planning. Yeah. It's been quite the journey. It has. It's been really fun. Yeah. We also, so this podcast, little does everyone know, maybe, my, one of my favorite books is Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. His favorite professor, he finds out he's passing away. Mm -hmm. He's slowly dying, so he goes to meet him and like kind of say goodbye and like just talk to him because it was like his inspiration. And he ends up meeting with him every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so the whole book is just about the life lessons that he taught him. So every week he comes back and they talk about something different. And I love it because... Marcus Anderson is like my Maury because we meet like Thursday mornings and we talk. When I'm not, when I don't text him and go, I'm literally dying. I got an hour and a half of sleep. I cannot meet you this morning. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. we typically meet and talk, and it's fun. So Marcus means a lot to me. And then Kristen. K Sal. <laughs> K Souden. You said not now. Still K Souden. Mm -hmm. I oh. didn't change it. Yes, she's, she's a liberated woman. Here. I love it. <laughs> she's a liberated woman. <laughs> like we also met through Cat. Through creative yeah, planning, yeah. but now you are a lead advisor. Mm -hmm. I wrote it. I work academic in, advisor. <laughs> yep, and I sat. So I'm still doing a lot of the same stuff I did in CAP. I'm mm -hmm. just doing it on the other side of campus. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just love her. We meet sometimes and talk. And I also filmed her wedding. <laughs> no big deal. You were at my wedding. That was. I was honored. I just cried in the heart for a long time. <laughs> I'm still crying in the heart, honestly. But so. I'm really excited. Oh. So you all started, I think also, Joey Locano, your story is interesting because you started as a student, you transferred to JMU, you're a student here, and they ba they basically built a position for you, right? Yeah, I'd be fair, so. Which is so <laughs> cool. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> on hair yeah. flip. So, and all of you, obviously, you transitioned, obviously, too, in your positions and your jobs. So, just in a general question, 
and you guys can bounce around and answer and y'all can have input too but what would you say about change like how do you deal with change in general in life the, the good and the bad mm-hmm. um, and what's the best way that you have found to be true to deal with change mm. that's a good one that was a good question Boom. <laughs> I have a good story for you oh I love <laughs> stories so one of the um, first days that I was on campus at JMU, I, I went to what's called the Center for Faculty Innovation. Have you ever heard of that before? Mm-mm. They help um, they help professors become better teachers. So they're a really fantastic group of folks on campus. But they were hosting this presentation on resiliency. And I'm not sure if you guys know this, but we have some of the leading resiliency experts in the nation at JMU in the psychology mm-hmm. department in between undergrad psych and grad psych. And so... I was really stressed out and scared because I had just left home for the first time and I was living in an apartment by myself and I thought that resiliency, this would be like a great thing to go to. And they started to talk about, these counselors started to talk about the emergency crisis counseling that they do and they had been to Haiti when there was the earthquake and they had gone to Virginia Tech after the shootings and they said that the amazing thing about resiliency is that sometimes it just it just happens like you know there's the human spirit is resilient and so at the end of the presentation they gave us these little bouncy balls and they made us play with the bouncy balls which was kind of funny but they it for every time you bounce a bouncy ball down it pops up twice as high and so they talked about like even when you know you're up against the floor you're getting thrown into a situation come back twice as hard yeah. and i still have that bouncy ball i don't i i, I carry it around in my um in my bag it. with me <laughs> I carried it around in my bag with me because it's like green and at this point it's kind of like gross because it's sat in there for so long but when I'm going through change I try to always just think about like what do I have to do to be resilient in this moment you know like how can I come back from this and and how can I be a better person for whatever is happening if that transition is good or bad I think transition is scary no matter what but Mm -hmm. you know you you can always you can always come back from it wow that's deep (laughs) That's bouncy. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, how do we deal with change? Mm-hmm. And personally or professionally? And mm-hmm. what are some insights we might have learned from change, yeah. I guess? Yeah, for sure. I feel as though that I don't handle change well. Mm-hmm. Um, but with that being said, I think I've, I've learned. Um, so here's what I've learned. So, anybody ever seen a movie Inception, right? Yeah. And so, in Inception, you always had to have a totem, something that when you're in the dreams, in, in the, between the dream state and then living in the dream world, you always had to have a point of reference to know, is this a dream or is this actual reality? You know what I'm saying? And and at the end of it, um, you had uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, he had his totem, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it was spinning, but it never really, like, fell. And he was like, and so for him, it was like, he knew that if the top didn't fall down that's how he knew he was in the dream world but if the top fell then that's how he knew it was reality so it was kind of like teetering a little bit so you never knew it really fell i think for me in change i always have to have a totem something that i can look towards to to know what's going on you know what i'm saying like where am i what's happening um um um, what can I do? And for me, spirituality, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, and, and for me, that is my totem. That is the thing that that is my anchor that grounds me when, when change happens. Um, I find that um, I don't handle change well because I'm a panicker. Like, externally, you would never know, but internally, I'm freaking out. Like, I'm just like, <laughs> is that a gift? But, is that a gift? Do you think is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because I'm the opposite. Yeah. Like I feel like if I keep it inside, I will literally explode. So I'm like, I'm like help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, help. like I wish that was not a thing. I think, I think, deal with that. <laughs> I think it's a learned behavior. Um, one being a student athlete, like you, like you gotta have grace under pressure. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like so, but being an offensive lineman for me, like the defense is always gonna throw something different at you. You know, and so we prepare for every scenario. <laughs> so even if the scenario never happens, I need to be prepared for what may happen even though I'm freaking out you know I need to like calm myself down find my totem Mm -hmm. and go from there um talk to people keep people in my life that that helped me my wife is one of them 
Um, when KSI worked here, we talked a lot about change because we were in the midst of a lot of change and, and kind of get my wrap my head around what um, what I'm facing. So for me, dealing with change, I just need to realize that I'm in the midst of a change. And once I realize I'm in the midst of a change, then I'm okay. Mm-hmm. But for me, the ambiguous state of, is this a change? Is this not a change? I feel different. Things are going weird. I don't understand what's going on. Where am I? Like those type of questions are really what do me in, you know? And so I can spend like sometimes hours or days or months just trying to figure out where I am but once I learn where I am I'm like oh season's yeah. changing okay bet then I'm good That's you so know true. so yeah so acknowledgement yeah like the first step ditto no. <laughs> <laughs> I agree no it's good to talk about that totem I mean I never really thought about it I love Inception and mm-hmm. I've taught it in class but I've never really thought about that and it's funny I can kind of see your reaction like wait you guys freak out about change too I mean mm-hmm. we freak out about stuff all the time oh, I mean yeah. we have I always felt like I was uh, Michael Clark Duncan in, uh, in the Green Mile. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, yeah. And all day long, and for you guys too, I know this, like people come in all day long, like, I got this problem, I got this problem, and by the end I'm like, I'm going to go home and cry for the next four hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, Real tall. <laughs> and, and thinking about it, um, I, I probably was an insomniac from the time I was about nine mm. until I met my wife. Wow. Mm. And I've slept like a baby every night since I met her, pretty much. That's across awesome, the board. So I know goals, right? Goals. Oh my God. <laughs> the other day, I was like, "You and your wife are goals. They are beautiful goals. people. Yeah, they are. Human beings. Just every. Oh, sorry, they are. I keep going on forever. But it's 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 you know it's someone who believes in you because there are times you're not going to believe in yourself. Amen. That's good. And so it's always someone who's like, "No, you you're good. You got this." And I I've been here 11 years and I've taught in four different departments yeah. and Change. some of those times it was. Well, we're not gonna have fat. We're cutting half of the faculty. That happened when I was in English, and they cut half of the faculty. And I got a letter in my box saying your contract is not being renewed. And I had been here for eight years, and I was like, this is my identity. It's who I am. Yeah. And I remember thinking, am I gonna have another career? Yeah. Am I gonna like? I'm not gonna do this anymore. I love doing this. What's gonna happen? And now I have a dream job. I mean, exactly what I want to be doing. That happened eventually. But I remember in that time going, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. Thankfully, uh, B.J. Bryson, who's in, so- in the social work department here, she was working at Waynesboro High School, <laughs> where my wife is, and doing a program with some students there who are underrepresented, and they were doing a summer program, and B.J. was like, we'd love to have you, and so that's what I did that summer, thinking, I don't have wow. a job, I don't know what I'm doing, yeah. but now I'm working in social work, you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't have a degree in this, I don't have any background in it, mm-hmm. um, but I had a blast doing that, and then got back into things, but for... My daughter had just been born, and then a few months later, I got a letter saying, you don't work here anymore. Wow. And that was like, oh, my God, I'm not going <laughs> to be able to support right, my bro. family, you know, all those things. But there, not just my wife, but there were also people within SMAD, within the SMAD department, who, since I was 20 years old, have been supportive of me and, and wow. supported me through things. So. Um, those are people that are still my mentors that I would love to do this with. They're they're nearing retirement now, um, but Uh-oh. these are people. These are people that still keep it going. Keep it, <laughs> keep going, it right? going. I'm passing passing the mic, not yeah. the torch. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I don't want to buy that, so you can just give me yours. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, but no, I think what Marcus said is great. Um, having having that totem is is important, and it's not just one person, you know. Ever, uh, I think you always have people around you who, and students do that too. I mean, students mm-hmm. are that. Um, that I'm sure for the two of you, like, I'm like, man, maybe I'm terrible at this. Maybe I'm no, and then, you know, and then someone's like, you helped me so much, or, yeah. oh my God, this project is making me, you know, and then we just chat in the hall. I'm like, okay, I have value. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Real and, talk. and we need that, you know, we need that every once in a while to feel like, oh, you know, I mean, paycheck is good, but mm-hmm. we get into this for different reasons. So um, having some sort of, you know, feedback from that is always good. Yeah, and like, I think, I think you just said it's important, like that community, um, of people that are around you, of of people that you can build with that know you, know your worth, and 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 sometimes can see things in you that you couldn't see in yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, um, Kate, Chris, and Salden was a person that like we latched on to each other just to finish our graduate program. Like it was like, hey, and she it was like it was that moment where you're in the trenches and and the war scenes like you're in the trenches and mm-hmm. and like the two people are fighting against the enemy and then they look up at each other and they're like we're gonna get through this like, <laughs> like 
we can do this. And so it was, it was, it was that for me. And then like, and so at least for me, in my point of view, mm-hmm. um, she was that for me. And like, my wife was another person. Um, and just it's people. not Kristen, then your wife. Wait. <laughs> 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 I'm married. I'm happily married. <laughs> Kristen is also happy. <laughs> um, but what was fun about that was that, like then, so we went from grad school to CAP together. Yeah. You know, we signed our contracts on the same day. Yep, you know, did. all the kind of stuff. So that Signing first day. year, <laughs> right? So yeah. That first rookie year when we were like, "What's happening? What are we doing?" We always had each other to be. To be real with, too. You know, I felt like I always could walk into your office or you could always walk into mine and be like, this isn't working. Yeah, you know, yeah. You need that authenticity. Mm-hmm. You need someone that you can let your guard down with. Mm-hmm. So that's awesome. And I have a question for you about that later, so that's fine. Oh, but okay. You said, we need that. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite quote, it's my literally my screensaver. So the beginning's cheesy, just ignore it. It's the end that's good. But it's, you'll need coffee shops and sunsets and road trips, airplanes and passports and new songs and old songs, but people more than anything else. You'll need other people, and you'll need to be that other person to someone else, a living, breathing, mm-hmm. screaming invitation to believe in better things. Yeah. Favorite quote. Yeah. That's what you guys awesome. do. But that's perfect, because it leads into our next question, well, sort of, about just sort of, like, making an imprint and an impact on someone's life. Um, and you guys can touch on this, because you're obviously very active, like Maddie's an APO, again, Student Alumni Association. Um, so being the change, that's one of JMU's motto, mottos. How do people go about that? And I know it looks different to everyone else, but what do you think it takes to be the change? Um, and what is like the most important thing to know for someone who wants to make an impact on people mm. in a positive way? Hmm. And anybody can jump in. <laughs> I think the most important part is just kind of figure out what that looks like for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like too often people kind of get caught in this mindset of what you think that change needs to be and kind yeah. of what you mm. think like an institution tells you to do or what... Um, your friends tell you, but it, it takes a lot of self-reflection to kind of figure out, you know, what are my values? What do I wake up every day wanting to accomplish? What do do I want to see in the world? Um, mm-hmm. Once you kind of figure out what that is for you, that's when only can you then effectively be that change. That's good. Um, something you have to create for yourself. And I feel like too often we kind of get into this this pattern. It's a very dangerous pattern of what have people done before me? What are people around me doing? And then you try to be a change that's not you, and you can't mm-hmm. effectively carry it out. It's just kind of something that's you're just kind of running with, but it's not authentic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with also not comparing your change to anybody else's because I know, mm-hmm. you know, you could look at someone and say, wow, they're doing all these amazing things. I'm not, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, and it's like being in an organization like APO surrounded with, you know, 80 plus people that do such incredible things mm-hmm. and to think that, okay, well, I volunteer once a week, you know, what this girl's doing this and this girl's doing that and that guy's going here. You know, I think it's just like change comes in so many different forms and, um, doing, you know, like Adrian said, doing what it like matters to you. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think one thing that's helpful too is is to find your people, like find your sphere of influence. Like I think Mother Teresa said this quote. She said, "I cannot change the world, but I can change one life." Mm-hmm. And so in that, I think it was her. I don't know. I'm not sure, but but in that, like I need to find my people. Like I don't Try. like I don't need to know. Like, I can't go there, you know what I'm saying? But I can go here, you know what I'm saying? And this is my sphere of influence. And if I am if I am being myself and, and and staying true to myself and not trying to compete but compliment in that um, or be in companionship with other people, um, then I can fully see the change that I want to see in the world around me. Um, I think that's finding your people is important and also... Um, um, oh, this is kind of in conjunction with it is that acknowledgement that something different needs to happen yeah. um, I think we preach be the change here but I think I think it's more a mm. philosophy and an idealized notion but not an actual practical application wow. um, and so it's one where where yeah I know I, like yeah be the change it's great yeah right mm. but then it's like but, but how do we feasibly do that like mm. you know what changes need to be had and where can I insert myself into what's already going on, yeah. you know, I think is important. That's amazing you say that. Um, I'm in a sociology class of new media and we were talking about social justice and social mm-hmm. movements um, on social media mm-hmm. and we talked about, in comparison, like, I guess, uh, calls to action and so mm-hmm. how, for example, the ALS bucket challenge, ice bucket challenge, mm-hmm. it specifically was like, donate or dump this on your head. Yeah. And then with, like, hashtags, it's, it's good because it's bringing attention, but it's, like, people want to know what's next. Like, what yeah. do you do? Yeah. They want to be involved, but it's, like, what do you do? So I think yeah. it's important, like, actually 
getting out there and doing something about it, like realizing it, but then being like, what are the steps that we're going to exactly. take? That's, yeah, that's when you yeah. got the social media protests on, like, you know, everybody want to protest, you know, um, in the African American community, Black, Black Lives Matter and all that mm-hmm. other stuff, but it's like, but we got to go to rallies, we got to go. Yeah. You know, we got to like sign petitions and get things, and that's just one small scale example, mm-hmm. and if that causes too much friction, you know, surrounding Black Lives Matter, like, insert whatever, ever movement, you know, into yeah. that, you know, um, yeah. And I feel as though that that a lot of people want to talk about what happened in the '60s of of like civil rights movement, other movements, but I feel like they had something going on there where where it's like we got I gotta put myself like there's gonna be a level of sacrifice that I'm gonna have to do in order to see this thing really happen. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like people were not like. The bus boycotts, people were not riding the bus. And at that time, before taxis and stuff, they walked to work. You know what I'm saying? And so I feel as though, like, it's not enough just to do a tweet. You know what I'm saying? Especially just talking about social justice movement. But I got to put some blood behind this, too. I got to put some sweat and some tears behind this in order for this change to really happen. And um, change is not an easy thing. It's something that's hard. It's something that's difficult. Um, Because my wife is pregnant right now, um, like, we're getting ready for labor. Like, and we're birthing a a baby into this world. And a woman is closest to death when she's bringing in life. So it's like, that's how change is. Like, change will cause me to die sometimes in order for life and new life to happen. It just gave me so much life. (laughs) It's just like, (laughs) dang. (laughs) Anybody else? I would. T- I completely agree with you, but I would take it from my experience more than what Maddie was saying. I think we live in an achievement-focused culture ge- in is. general, but especially at JMU, and it's like I'm in these ten different clubs, and I raised sixty thousand dollars, and and all of that is great, and it's you know we do resumes for a living, so you know those things look really nice when you put them on your resumes. But one of my proudest moments of being the change at JMU was buying one of my students' dinner who I knew hadn't eaten in three days. Like, that was me being the change. And that was one dinner, and when breakfast came, he had to eat again, and I wasn't there for that one. But I think there's something about, like, living in those little gap moments of... Um, yeah, just just living in those just living in those little moments of change instead of the big ones. And you can do both, but... I, I sometimes want to say, like, you are, Mia, you are the change. Like, yeah. there's no, like, being the change. You know, y- y- by being you, all of you, you've done this. And that's that's just incredible. I think we all feel privileged to do the work that we do because we get to interact with students who literally live the change. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And that achievement thing, um, you guys don't just have it. I mean, you're, you've been K through 12, like, get this on, on it. Like, you're going to have to apply to colleges. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to have to get an internship. Now you're going to have to get a job. Like, mm-hmm. start piling all these things. And when it comes down to it, people invest in you. Like, that's what employers invest in. They invest in who you are. They meet, you know, as long as you can get in the door for an interview. Um, I've been unqualified for a number of jobs I've held. <laughs> I've been a degree short. I've had the wrong degree, you know. <laughs> I, my That's first really job, my first job after graduating from SMAD was as a mortgage insurance underwriter. <laughs> oh, wow, I see the correlation. Yeah. Wow. I did. Wow. I, you never told me that. I underwrote. We got a lot. We got to talk about still. <laughs> <laughs> um, we. Uh, I did that for three years on and off while I was going to grad school here, and I was driving to Nova, working there three days a week, wow. thirty hours a week, and then I was wow. going to grad school here full time oh with a degree goodness. in English, and. You know, when I went into that interview, I, I was laid back in my chair, and I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, and I had a whatever attitude, and then months after they hired me, they said, do you know why we hired you? I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and my boss, said, my boss said, you were so relaxed. We interviewed a lot of people, but you were the most relaxed, and I was like, can I be honest with you? I didn't want the job. Wow. <laughs> I was like, it was far away. It was an hour and a half from my house, you know? And so. Dang. I, I think. Oh, my God. I think. <laughs> Thug life. Thug <laughs> life. <laughs> so. I think there's a vision that, that students have Jeez, that, um, th- that you know, we all got to where we're at because we're somehow the most fit and yeah. we're the, the greatest yeah. geniuses that the world yeah. has ever seen, yeah. you know? That's and true. it's really not, and a lot of those things, it's, it's, I mean, it is skill and we all are qualified to do what we're doing just as mm-hmm. you all are qualified to be doing the things that you're going to be doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but luck does come into play and getting to know people comes into play. That's true. Mm-hmm. We, That's also, so true. we also, though, to go off of what Kristen and Maddie said, we have this. Uh, we have the same requirements you have, where, the, where there's this pressure to innovate, mm-hmm. and which I don't really. 
uh, not that I don't participate in it, but I don't participate in it heavily because that takes time away from meeting with the three of you yeah. over issues that you might have because now I got to go do this innovative thing across campus, which is great on paper, but it's not in your life and it's not buying breakfast for somebody or dinner for somebody where that, I mean, I would take that every day, buying dinner for somebody yeah. then putting another line item on my CV, yeah. you know, and so, but, but we're, but we're pressured to, to do those kind of things too. Like, Oh, get involved in this. And I'm like, I'm involved in my students' lives. Like, yeah. um, I was given a tour earlier today and every student that walked by was like, Hey Joe, Hey Joe. And the mom was like, do you know everyone? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah, that's yeah. how we yeah. met. It is random. I've never taught me. I was never his advisor. <laughs> <laughs> she asked me to be that's here. So, so yeah. you're great. I love all that. Wow. I agree with both of those. So happy. Okay, so a question for Marcus specifically. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked a lot over the last few weeks um, about just friendship and mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. So I just really wanted to ask just very generally, like no specific questions. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that because you told me so many great things that I would love for other people in the world to hear. Yeah. I guess we've talked about the importance of just like loving other people and loving mm -hmm. on other people. So if you want to just branch from there and just talk for just a few yeah. minutes about it. I like for me relationships are the lifeblood of life you know what I'm saying like they're the blood they're the system of life so it's like if I get to a point and I'm by myself then I failed having those relationships and building those relationships are essential um, like in football like a lot of these epiphanies came as playing being a student athlete in college like um, even though I was an offensive lineman, I was a part of a system, you know what I'm saying? And we, as a system, we had to operate together in order for our main objectives to be met. And so I, there was always this mentality of that I can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. Like, like that, that, that if I'm pushing the ball down the field or whatever, like, yes, my wide receiver make a play, but it's because I blocked here mm -hmm. that freed my quarterback up to throw the ball down the field. So, for me, I view friendship very much in that way, that each each person plays a role in my life and that I'm going to have an effect in their life, they're going to have an effect in my life, and together we're going to build and it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. We're going to frustrate each other, we're not going to, we might grow distant at times, but at, but but we're going to continue to build something yeah. that, that, that that will help all of us grow and benefit from each other. So relationship is essential. Like, you can't live this life alone. Like, one of the worst things that you can do to a human being, one of the worst forms of torture is actually solitary and confinement because you lose your mind. Mm -hmm. As human beings, we are wired for relationship. We are yeah. wired to be together. Yeah. And so, and so, um, I was telling my group, group of my students, I was like, look, I was like, you can say you hate people all you want, but you still got your boo thing. You still got that, <laughs> you still got that person that you like, but I like them though. But you don't hate people. No, like you don't you don't hate people. No person hates people. No, you still need somebody around you. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, like I, I value relationships. And I'm a person that I can once I connect to you, it's almost like I'm connected to you for life. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like and I know yes. life may <laughs> <laughs> life may have its turns and life may have its its different ways, but like I value um, those relationships so like having Joe and, and Case out here I was like yo like these my folk like these my people so yeah it's interesting because obviously I talked to like Dr. Warner about leadership and mm -hmm. like that outward sort of connection yeah. and Pappas talked about inward connection and knowing yourself and being able to be alone and it's so interesting because I had another student of his and a friend on the show and afterwards he came up to me and he was like you know, I agree with ninety percent of what he said, mm -hmm. but the other ten percent I didn't agree with was that we are meant to be alone because we're not. we're not. We're meant to be connected to other people. And he said, even more important than the ability to love is the opportunity to love, and loving and forgiving is all the same thing. Yeah. And I was like, why did you say that on the show? So I'm saying it now because I'm pissed he didn't say that. I was like, I literally was like, I stopped and I was like, are you kidding? You yeah. couldn't say that. One. So, anyways, yeah. I would, I would add on to that. So the ability to love and the opportunity to love, but also the opportunity to be loved as well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? like like to receive love from somebody That's else important. and to and to know that I'm deeply loved, I'm valued by somebody. Um like that that's important. We need like um, this dude named Matt Chandler said, "If you can, if you continue to treat people with a lack of dignity, don't be surprised when they act in an undignified manner." Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so that ability to receive love is vital for us and and, and who we are. Um, that's why I'm so effusive in my in my like affection for people because I want you to know like hey I love you That's like I care about you deeply if you are not here there's a piece of me that would be missing you know what I'm saying and 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 I love to receive that back as well so 
I do agree. I do agree. I think you do need your alone time, but you also need your time with people too. Mm-hmm. So cool that you said that about um, how other people, re- uh, how you know that you want to make sure other people know that. Yeah. Because that's that's obvious. I mean, it's evident. Yeah. Anybody yeah. knows you. That's evident. But it's almost uncool now to care that much about anything, yeah. whether it's a person, yeah. whether it's a thing. Yeah. Like it's uncool to care. Um, I'm still friends with people that I went to middle and high school with. We Me lived too. together in college. We we're in each other's weddings. We still come and yeah. see one another. My friend drove all the way from DC metro area to Charlottesville to run a 5K with me, and then drove back home. Mm. Like wow, this is yeah. the kind of friends that I have. And people go, "Aren't you guys different? We're all different." He's an accountant. Like we're not. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> We all have these different things, but they knew me when I wasn't who I am now. Mm-hmm. And one of my favorite quotes is from the movie Almost Famous, one, which is one of my favorite films. And yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman is playing a, a real person uh, named Lester Bangs, uh, who was a music journalist. And he says, the only real currency in this bankrupt world is what you share with someone else when you're mm. uncool. Wow. Mm. wow. I like that. And, and I think, like, back when I was in middle school wearing, uh, uh, like, red jean shorts. Red <laughs> <laughs> <Damn, laughs> shorts! <laughs> you know, but I'm cool with that. And that's the thing, is that yeah. friendship has maintained. And, yeah, mm-hmm. we don't talk about the things I talk about when I'm at work. Like, yeah, whether right. it's about college or whether it's about... Um, you know, films. We don't watch mm-hmm. the same films. We don't like the same kind of stuff. But these are the people that mm-hmm. that I love, that I do love, and 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 they know that, and we all know that with one another. And so yeah. Yeah, I think I think saying that, especially with the way it is now, that it's not cool, especially for your generation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, sucks to for us. Actually, we're not care right? about anything. Um, you know, it's it's sort of seen as uncool to care about things, to, yeah. to do that, to show that. I think yeah. is such a valuable thing today. I, what the way I grew up in my in my subculture context of a black urban kid from um from from Miami, like you know, and black males where I grew up did not show that much. You know, effect. It was like, yo, like, yo, what's good, dog? How you doing? You good? All right, man. Keep your head up, baby. And that's all. You know what I'm saying? And so when I got to college, um, and I had just a series of epiphanies, I was like, I love this. Like, this is one of my best friends, Big Mike. I was like, yo, like, I love you, Big Mike. Like, you my, like, you my man, fifty grand. Like, like, you know, I'm not, not an affectionate love, but like a brotherly type love. Like, I look at Big Mike like he is Marcel. I have a twin brother, so like. Like, randomly one day, I was like, hey, yo, man, um, I love you, dog. He was like, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'll holler at you. <laughs> and, and I was like, and I was like, why can't I tell the men in my life that I, that I care so deeply about that I would die for that I love them? There's something wrong with that. You know? And then ever since then, I was like, tell my brother, like, hey, man, I love you, bro. I care about you, man. He would be like, uh, um. Yeah, dog. Like, get out of here with all that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, I like ever since the, ever since I had that epiphany around about my sophomore year, I was like, I just started telling people like, Hey, man, I love you. I care about you. I don't care if it makes me look funny or if it makes me feel weird, but mm-hmm. but I'm gonna keep telling you this until you respond. So now, years later, I haven't done this. Mm-hmm. Um, Big Mike was like, Hey, man, I love you. I love you, Big Mike. He was like, Man, I love you too, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, and and so it's now. You changed him. Yeah, like yeah. it changed. Mm-hmm. Like that's being the change. Like so it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like I, 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 I really, like that, that just, that just resonated with me. Um, Cause like when you lose people, it's like, man, I wish I could have told them I love them more. I wish I could have let that, let that joint go. I wish I could have willing, had that willingness to want to be there, you know. And I don't want to live life like that. I want people to know, if you were to go on, like if I never were to see you again, I want you to know, hey. I'm looking at Chris and Sada just for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but if I never see Chris and Sada again a day in my life, I want her to know that, hey, I know Marcus Anderson, like, we had a connection that, that, I, that I love him and he loved me. So, For the record, awesome. he did not look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. You know I love you, Jay. <laughs> okay, can we put that in the podcast? Joe, sure. you know I love you. <laughs> okay, so for Joe, That's so my question funny. for you, okay, so... It's interesting. So, like, our, like obviously, we met through CAP, and, like, we all have our sort of, like, relationships to each other. But with Joe, we didn't know each other. And it was by, like, happenstance, like, an accident that we met. And then every time I saw you in the hallway, in the SMAD hallway, we would just talk. And every time, I just felt like I left the conversation feeling, like, impacted. And, like, my day was brighter. Um, and I think it's just because, to a certain degree, you're very just open with students. That's true. Um, and I love that about you. So if you could talk about that and just the importance of being kind and open and transparent with people and why should people do that in their lives? Yeah. We only know each other because 
our director, Dr. <laughs> Flamiano, had a cold <laughs> and said, can you go to lunch? Do you know Mia? And I was like, no. <laughs> can you take her to lunch? Sure. <laughs> um, so that's how we met and hit it off right away, yeah. of course, and, and had a conversation not unlike this one about all kinds of things and, mm -hmm. and opened up right away. Um, I think uh, it's incredibly difficult. Um, I've, for 11 years, I've been advising for SMAD, and my role has been for students who aren't in the major. Mm -hmm. So I'm usually dealing with disappointed students, and then mm -hmm. I also send them to Marcus. <laughs> That's yeah. how we know each other so <laughs> That's well. That's exactly how we know each other. <laughs> I send them to Marcus. And so when you have to deal with that, I think it can get, I think it can be really easy to start to say these are only temporarily going to be my advisees so I don't really need to care about them I don't need to meet mm, these people that's good Joe um, because I could easily do that and no one would really know it wouldn't really affect anything I mean I would give them information but I wouldn't really care but mm -hmm. Marcus has been Marcus comes when when we don't admit students we have a, a meeting for students who aren't admitted and Marcus comes and is there for that conversation because I think it's good to have both somebody who is a part of that system because I am a part of the system but Marcus isn't and so mm -hmm. I, I think I'm sympathetic. I hope I come off as sympathetic no, you do. You do. to their experience, but I know Marcus can also do something that I can't, which is he's sort of an outsider to that situation, and to, um, he doesn't sit on the committee um, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So um, having that, that, that voice, I think, is important, but mm -hmm. I, I tell them, the ones who aren't admitted, because I think those are sort of the forgotten SMAD majors, the ones who yeah. really wanted to do this and don't get to do this. That's true. Um, and I tell them, Marcus can attest to this, that I say, don't let a department tell you you can't do what you love. Yeah, that's um, true. The great thing about what we do is anybody can learn how to do this. You're doing a podcast, not for a class. You bought a microphone, you grabbed your laptop, you grab some people, and you're doing a podcast. And so I'm always trying to tell people, like, see yourself as, as that way. But after 11 years, I, it could wear on me. Um, I have uh, I have 200 advisees most of the time, and that's not including any of the, SMAD, any of the people that I are mean. actually in the major. And, <laughs> and, and, and really, I mean, truthfully, there are probably a couple of hundred more um, within the major that I still help. And um, I'm always honest. I think it's important to be honest. I would never lie to a student. Um, I would say I'm not going to tell you that if I wasn't going to tell you that, but I would never make up a lie. Um, and so I'm always going to tell you the truth. I've told people the truth of my own background, which I didn't apply to colleges. Um, I went to a, I, I'm from New Orleans, and I'm kind of like you. Like, I mean, I'm from New Orleans East, so it's yeah. a poor neighborhood, but it's kind of on the edge. And yeah. it's coming back post-Katrina, but before Katrina, it was really bad. Um, and uh, so I grew up there and then moved from one of the poorest places to the wealthiest county in the country, Loudoun County, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And this is when I was nine, eight, eight, when I was eight. And... Um, and so I saw these two worlds. I saw one where like nobody really cared about education, Louisiana, and then Loudoun County where it was the schools were palaces and everybody was like, oh, you're gonna go to college, go to college. And no one in my family had been to college. Mm -hmm. And so I was told, this is probably what a big part of inspiring me to be the kind of person I am. Um, my senior year of high school, my English teacher, I almost failed English. Um, I almost failed a lot of classes that year, but English in particular. <laughs> And, and I went to, we worked it out so that I could graduate and get a D, and I got a bunch of Ds. Uh, Ds get degrees, right? Oh. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. Um, and so, um, so I went to graduate. We, gra we were a big high school, so we graduated at George Mason, and I was getting ready to go through the tunnel. I can, I, as I'm telling you this, I can vividly see it. I'm about to walk out of the tunnel, and a teacher put their hand right in front of me and said, where are you going? And I was like, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to sit in there with everyone else. And they go, you, you didn't graduate? I was like, yeah, I did. And so they went and got my English teacher. She walked over and said, oh, yeah, he passed my class, but he'll never pass a college-level English class. Oh. That was the last thing said to me as I walked across, you know, before I walked across the stage to get my diploma. And the thing, the reason I tell that is not like, ha-ha, showed her. It's, I Although believed did. it. I believed, <laughs> I believed it for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the things that you tell young people, they're going to really latch on to. Because yeah. I did, and I thought I was dumb. And I have a master's degree in English, and I taught it here for eight years. And she said I would never pass the college level English class. So I didn't apply to college because I was like, well, I guess I'm dumb. Um, and then I went to community college, and uh, really that was because I was helping friends move into JMU during freshman move-in week. And I showed up at my community college three days before the semester began and said, can I take classes here? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you have money? Cool. We like money. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got into my classes at community college, and they're like, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh, God, I am dumb. And they're like, no, you don't belong here. You're, you're too smart for that. You need to get out of here. You're in the wrong class. You know? and, like, and so then I had some really good mentors at community college. Mm -hmm. um, I had terrible advisors here, but I had um, one. Smad professor in particular who sort of took me under his wing his first year in my la his first year teaching here and my last year 
as a student and told me about graduate school and really inspired. That was Alex Lee Holt. For the, for the record, Alex <gasps> no, Lee Holt. Yeah. No way. Oh, um, it would be him. Yeah, so he was he was really, um, you know, he was really important in that. So I, I think the most important thing is always being honest and upfront. I'm very upfront about, I tell my students, uh, Maddie knows from being in class, on the first day of class, I tell students, and I've done this every semester that I've ever taught, every single class, I say, I almost flunked English. This is when I taught English. Mm-hmm. I almost flunked this subject. And I was like, you all did better in high school, so you should at least be able to get A's in here, right? I mean, I'm <laughs> teaching the class. Mm-hmm. You, know, and I, you know, I got a D. You guys got A's probably. You guys got AP credit. I didn't get any AP credit. <laughs> um, and so I think knowing that, you see people that teach you and the people that advise you as human beings, which is forgotten a lot of times. I mean, that's mm-hmm. probably the biggest misconception is that the three of us aren't human beings mm-hmm. with, you know, lives and, you know, <laughs> other things that we care about besides mm-hmm. just the things here. Yeah, um, sure. People be like, did you grade my stuff? It's been a day. No, I was being a dad. Like, you know, I got other stuff when I leave here, you know, it's not just you that I think about. I mean, I do think about that a whole lot and it affects me. Um, But no, I I think that's, uh, I've never become numb so far. That's not even wood. Something's gotta be what none of this is. Don't hear it. My phone. Oh, here, here. Is that wood? Oh, oh look at little, your phone. it's fake wood. Oh man. But it looks like it. It's fine. It's, it's, I've, it's I've, I've, and I, I want everyone in the room to keep me in check. I never want to be that kind of person. I think those kind of people do exist. I mean, where they're like, I don't care. I don't care what happens to students. It's not my job. I mean, I see everything as my job. If you guys are unhappy, then I'm unhappy. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, so I care when I see Maddie upset in the hallway. I'm like, it's okay. You're going to survive this. It's going to be cool. you graduate <laughs> soon. Oh, <laughs> just like a quick anecdote. He saw me in the hall like, it was like three weeks ago. Yeah. I've been up for like 48 hours doing a project. I had no freaking clue what I was mm-hmm. doing. He's like, how you doing? I was like, do we want to open that can of worms? Like, <laughs> and I was just like, all right, Joe, let's have a conversation about how I'm doing. Yeah. So, yeah, and I can attest to that. I mean, like, I, when I go through, like, my biweekly midlife crisis and, like, last, su- I guess, spring, when he was advising all of his kids, and I was just like, I need to figure my life out. Can I come sit in your office? And he was like, yep. And he had seen, like, 30 kids before me, but, like, still sat down with me to help me figure out what I was going to do. So, I mean, even for your non advisey kids, that means the world. Like... That's awesome. I would say, like, in, like I think I, that's something I really admire about you, and, that, and it makes you accessible as well. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, people want to come talk to you and want to figure out what's going on. You yeah. know? So I just, I just really like that about you. I love that. Uh, I've never told you this, but I'm gonna tell you this uh, on the microphone. You know, the microphone <laughs> for the first time. I tell when I give students your contact info, I'm like, you should go talk to Marcus Anderson. He's over in Cap. He's a good person to talk to. And if you don't like him, something's wrong with you. <laughs> I tell him that every time. I'm like, if you don't like him and he doesn't help you, something is wrong with you. <laughs> That's crazy. It's awesome. on the record. All right, awesome. Miss Kristen Stoudin. My question for you. Yes. Honestly, okay, you hear a lot of things in your life, right? But I'm not kidding when I tell you that the keynote you gave at the CAP conference was honestly... I was, I was going between two conferences that day, and I'm not going to lie, I wasn't sure how that one would pan out in comparison to the other one because I love women in leadership so much. But ex- you killed it. It was one of, it was not even one of, the best keynote speech I've ever heard. And I love you talked about authenticity and being genuine in your why. I actually, I mentioned this. I, ta- I told your story about the video and then like kind of things that you said in another podcast because oh, I still wow. think about it. Um, but did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, um... I'm working on my PhD right now, and Mm. with that comes a lot of, why am I doing this? (laughs) (laughs) But one of the things, so last semester I took a class on leadership, which is obviously a big thing at um, Mm -hmm. GMU, and there's tons and tons of leadership theories, and really there's no right one. It's all about the one that you resonate most with, and the one that resonates most with me is called authentic leadership. And... I think the reason that it resonates most with me is that it's values-based. It's all about being who you are and being who you are all the time, regardless of the situation that you're in or the power that's above you or the privilege or whatever. But it's also... um, it's also a lot of times spawned by this idea of a trigger moment. So sometimes leaders have things that happen to them that aren't great and they decide to come back from it. And you talked about, I think, your, whether or not you know it, your trigger aware, moment. Yeah. <laughs> We've talked about your trigger moments. Yeah. And I think that those moments a lot of times um, can break people down and build them back up into these fantastic um, people who just, who just want to be themselves. Mm-hmm. So... Um, for that, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember what the I video? did. The video. So, 
but I did authentic leadership. Oh, and the job search. So this mm-hmm. is actually perfect. Um, so one of the things, I found this really funny video, um, and it was called It Starts With Why. And at first it was this guy, and you know, they were, it was like they were at a game show. And he said, okay, I hear you're a singer. Can you sing for me? And he starts singing Amazing Grace, and he's doing a great job. And, and he's like, okay, now I want you to sing Amazing Grace again, but I want you to do it like this just happened to you and this just happened to to you basically it's saying like be the most authentic version of who you are and he was he just like blew it out of the park with this amazing amazing um rendition Whoa. of amazing he got a standing ovation it's he got crazy. a standing ovation people were at the side insane. like oh my god I mean, because it was so good but the whole point of the video was that it starts with why. If you're just singing the song of your life, you can do fine at it. You can be on key and it can sound nice. But if you know what that why is and you're getting up every morning to think about that, then wow, you're going to have the most beautiful song, um, the mu- most beautiful song there is. So for me, that was finding my place in student affairs. You know, I think for a long time, I'm also first generation, and I thought that you went to college to get a better job than you if you didn't go to college. I just, I had no no one around me to really teach me those kinds of things, and so I went to school thinking that I was gonna be a, a middle school language arts teacher, and that was good. I was singing a good song while I was there, but I wasn't like living and breathing it, and then I found while I was in college, I had a trigger moment where I had just a, terrible experience and really needed someone like Joe or like Marcus to pull me aside and say like, hey, are you okay? And that was when I decided that I had to do something different. And there are days where, you know, it's cold outside or it's raining and I don't want to get up or I don't want to, it's Friday, right before graduation, I don't want to be at work. But when I think about what I do, I am so, so privileged to work with the students that I do, to create the relationships that I have. I think I get, and I'm lucky enough to work in a community where I get to be the best version of myself every single day because everyone responds to that. And so I I just feel really strongly that authentic, being being the best version of yourself is always the, is always the greatest option because you're starting with that why, particularly Particularly, and I'll bring this back around, when you're in moments of transition and change, right? That's when you're most being tested as like, why am I doing this? And so if you can be yourself in that moment, you're going to be, you're going to be great. Mm-hmm. I have to say, Mia came up to me after <laughs> and she was like, that was the most inspiring thing I have ever seen. And I felt like, oh my God, I felt, I mean, honored. I'm so true. I'm so serious when I say that. I literally, so I tell people about randomly. I feel like it's the sort of thing when you saw people in the street and you're like, can I tell you about this thing? Like, I was about once in this presentation and this amazing woman said, anyways. But okay, so last question, then we have a speed round and then we'll like wrap it up. Mm. So last question, biggest life lesson. That's a huge question, but like what's one thing you just mm. have learned? Maybe even if you want to hone it down recently. Yeah. Um, embrace where you are. Um, uh, my my dad died when I was twelve, and so that was a, a, a that was your trigger moment. That was a, that was a huge trigger moment in my life because I was a daddy's boy, and so in that um, this past summer, my wife and I experienced a lot of death. Um, my sister in law her and her three year old daughter were murdered. Um, my one of my really close cousins he died from can- stomach cancer. My uncle died from Alzheimer's and complications with that. And in December, another one of my uncles died from from throat cancer. So um, over the summer, um, and then I tore my Achilles in in um, on Easter of last year. So from April to December, I just wasn't here. I mean, I was. I, I looking back, I was depressed, and so um, and I was in a. It was in a fog and a haze, and I didn't know where I was, where I was going. I didn't know my up from my down, my left from my right. And um, in the midst of that, I was in really, just a really, really bad place. All this death is happening. And for two to three weeks at a time, I was in between Florida, Georgia, or um, Richmond. And so I was talking with one of my mentors, and I was like, man, and I was really thinking about my dad. My dad was really heavy. And um, and I said, yo, um, you know, um, I, I was like, this happened when I was 12. I'm 28 years old, or it was 29 at that time. I was like, you know, and I'm like, I just need to get over it. I should be done over this, and, and, and I need to let it go. And my mentor, um, he looked at me. He said, embrace where you are. It's okay for you to be mourning your father when you're 29 um, because life is different than when it was when you were 12. 
And that just spoke so much to me and what I need. I just started crying right there because I needed to hear that of embracing where you are. If these things are happening to you and your life is where it is, embrace them. Don't try to justify them or explain them away, but be like, you know what? This is where my life is right now. It's not always going to be this way, but I need to embrace where I am. And once I learn to embrace where I am, um, that fog that would that I was in broke a little bit. Um, I still had some month, more months in it, but it really helped me um, help me um, in the state of transition. Um, and it was something that 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 I that I'm learning consistently how to do to embrace where I am. Amazing. I so you shared your favorite quote earlier. <clears throat> My favorite quote is the best thing to hold on to in life is each other. Mm-hmm. And I think that actually it's kind of the same sentiment there. Mm-hmm. But you know I. Um, Yesterday, I was thinking about my graduation. <laughs> when I graduate, it's I, I've it's six years since I graduate graduated from undergrad, and I was thinking about being in the same shoes that you guys are in, and not really knowing what was happening next, and trying to make my parents proud, and all that kind of stuff. And the the most <clears throat> important thing that came out of that to me was the relationships. And so I texted my best friend from college and said, "Hey, I love you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I miss you. You know, like thank you, thank you for being a part of my story." And I talk to my parents every day and I see my husband and you know a lot of times I'll just say I just need to say I love you one more time it's you know I know I've already said it to you five times today I just need you to know it and so in the midst of all of this we have each other and and those relationships you know whether they are um people who are with us or people who are not there there's always a little piece of them with us and that's gotta hang on to that I love it that's good good, Um, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna do two quick ones. Okay, um, <laughs> okay with it. <laughs> the first, the first one is, um, I think we now live in a way of like looking over at someone else's plate and seeing what they have and going, mm. I want that too. Mm, That's good. Wow. Um, but we should be looking over there, making sure they have enough, not what we have and comparing wow. it back and forth. But like, That's woo! I'm taking that. <laughs> I'm taking that, bro. I'm taking that. <laughs> But, Yo, that's deep. <laughs> I'm taking that, bro. Um, but I think yeah. we do that, and I think um, for at least for the three of us in the room, you know, the three of us who work here, um, <laughs> we the three of us have have punted on money in our lives. Um, we are doing that right now. Um, we, <laughs> we could be making twice, three times what we're making um, doing something else um, with the you know uh, with the um, uh, skills that we have, with the degrees that we have. Um, but we like doing this, so it's not. If I did that all day long, I'm gonna lose mm-hmm. the money one. But mm-hmm. I look at what I have and go, well, I got this, and they don't have that. Mm-hmm. You know, they they should have it. And I've talked to my friends about this who make three, four, five times what I make, <laughs> and live in Northern Virginia, and they got a friend of mine just built a fifty thousand dollar deck on his house, and I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, wow. that's like two wow. car, three cars, <laughs> you know, for me. Wow. Um, but. You know, these people who, in some cases, not that particular friend, but some who hate going to work, and they're like, man, I wish I could be like, I was like, you can. You go do what you love. Oh, well, I need to buy this house. And I, it's like, man, you can get a good house and be happy. And so it's it's finding those things you value, but I think it's important to, to look at your own, you know, to, to look at someone else's plate, make sure they have enough, and make sure that, that they always have things to do. My wife teaches in a... Uh, I don't know what the term we're using for the school district, but there are a lot of people on free and reduced lunches. There are a lot of, just what Kristen's talking about, like you know, students who can't eat, students who um, also have issues that they're, that they're coming to terms with and mm-hmm. they don't want to check out a book in the library because they're worried someone will know they checked it out. Yeah. So we have, and I've told you this, Mia, we've, we've built a library in my wife's classroom mm-hmm. and it's now huge. We spent our own money doing this. And the rule is, the rule is don't write down your name anywhere. No, no trace of you taking it out. Just bring it back at some point. They all have little like kind of stamps on them, uh, little butterflies, mm-hmm. um, and little like kind of stamps on the spine of every book. Um, That's so that kids know to bring it back, that it's from her. But we figure if a kid steals a book, it's like the greatest thing that could happen. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you want to read so bad, you know, <laughs> yeah. I will happily buy another book for that. So I think for us, yeah. it was that, that we got to grow up. My wife is also a first generation, uh, college student. And she has a master's degree in in, educa- in, in education, um, and is department head of her high school at our high school, um, and so we are always realizing how lucky we are to have the jobs we have. Our parents, all all of our parents, <laughs> for me, both of my st- step parents too, um, have all worked jobs that they don't 
love yeah. to put their kids in a better place than they were. Yeah. And we're lucky to be in that better place now. Mm-hmm. So we kind of look at that and go, we're good. I mean, we're good with what we got on this plate in front of us. I just want to make sure this one's got enough on it to have those kind of opportunities. Um, the other one is a little bit of a test for Maddie. Favorite, one of my favorite quotes, do you remember it? Yeah. Samuel Beckett? No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Fail, can't graduate, <laughs> retroactive grade <change. laughs> Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I say this is at the beginning of any writing class I've ever taught, I have students on the second day of class bring in the greatest piece of writing mm-hmm. they've ever read. Mm-hmm. And so we can talk about great writing in different forms. And so I have everyone go, and then I go and I read a passage from Mrs. Dalloway, which is my favorite novel of all time. I remember this. I got remember it. that one? Yeah. You got the other one now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one, though. And then, and then I quote Samuel Beckett, who, said, who has a character in a play, say, try, uh, ever tried, ever failed. Um, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better, mm-hmm. which has been used in a lot of different a lot of different ways, and you'll see it on shirts now and things like that. Uh, no one knowing that it came from a, you know, 1940s playwright. Um, but that is something that resonates with me because I have failed so many times in my life, but I was so fearful of it. But how fearful I was of it, the pales in comparison to mm-hmm. how fearful your generation is of failure. My brother is in your generation. My brother will be 21 this June. We're 16 years apart. Um, and my brother the, is afraid of screwing up. And I've talked to so many students who are like, well, I don't want to apply for this job because what if I don't get it? I'm like, dude, I applied for 14 jobs in one year at JMU. I got this one. <laughs> you know, I applied for jobs in CAP. I didn't hear from Marcus. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've applied for jobs all over, and that rejection, that rejection is something that, like, isn't personal. Like, mm-hmm. there are a lot of people that apply for jobs. There were probably a ton of people that applied for my job, and I know for a fact, because one of them is in our advising network, someone else who applied for my job and didn't get it. Mm-hmm. And we're good friends. She is one of my best friends at this university, and we were both applying for the same job. It wasn't, those things aren't personal, you know, those are things where it's like, hey, we got a lot of really good candidates for this. And so that, that fear of failure, it can be the most paralyzing thing in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, when I graduated college was probably the worst year of my life was after I graduated college. Mm-hmm. Um, I had lost a ton of weight. I was hospitalized. Um, this is something I really don't ever share with anybody, but I was hospitalized. I weighed under 125 pounds. I'm six feet tall. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, my friends were like, thought I was dying. I was, and I kind of was. Um, and a lot of it was just due to not knowing what I was going to do with my life and feeling like I had failed because I was so busy looking over at somebody else going, well, they got this and I don't have that yet. And they got this job and I didn't get that job. And, and kind of those fears that I hear from you guys a lot of like, well, so Maddie, you mentioned this earlier, like so-and-so got this or so-and-so yeah. is doing this or has this accolade. Like that's going to happen. Um, but that doesn't make you not successful because I would pick, you mentioned the Emmy, like I'd pick doing this over an Emmy, and I would love an Emmy, mm-hmm. but I mean, I love this to be able to have this effect yeah. on this many people. Yeah. Emmy's awesome too, Rusty, <laughs> just in case Rusty listens to it. You're going to love one of these questions, awesome. You're going to love one of these um, questions. The, the Emmys, th- those things are great, but I, I, I really value the advising award that I've won mm-hmm. on campus. Like to me, that means everything. Um, mm-hmm. And because it's recognition from not my peers, but from the people that I'm here to help. Um, wow. Because that is nominated completely from students, and so that's what I care about, or how students. Be. I mean, I care how my peers look at me, but if they think they think I'm a little bit crazy, probably. <laughs> um, but I care that you guys get the best help that you can get. Um, so that that only comes from looking over and saying, "Oh, what does Mia need? What does Maddie need? What does Adrian need?" Even though we just met, <laughs> um, but being able to do that, I'm serious. If Adrian had sent me an email and said I've got all these questions and Mia told me to come, I would do that. I would totally do that. Um, I don't care who it is. I want to help people who are here because I really care about the place. Because yeah. I, my wife and I have four degrees total from this place, so yeah. we're still paying JMU. <laughs> we're, still, we're still paying off student loans, so we really care about this place, and it's why we dug up our lives and moved here. It was for that, but it's only through a lot of failure and. As, as dark as kind of like I mean it's not on the level of what Marcus is talking about at all um, but when you have those dark times when you're in them it's terrible mm-hmm. but I'm kind of thankful for him in some ways because mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I agree too. the sweet isn't as sweet without the sour you know and so yeah. you, get, you get that sour stuff in life and, and then you appreciate these times you appreciate you know having having your daughter is going to be yeah. amazing you know bringing life you've had this year of death and now you got this life coming back into Real the world talk. and you're yeah Real talk. So, so yeah this is amazing. I just like I just need to stop and look. It's like uh, I, I finally now that I'm through finals, I feel like I'm like, having those senior moments where I look around. And I'm just like so grateful. I'm, so. I'm not gonna get emotional. There's no time for that. We have to do the speed round. Okay, 
So we're gonna do these really quick. Since there's three of you, it might be a little bit scary. So we're gonna <laughs> limit it to like, give me like a sentence. Are you ready? Yeah. Who's starting? <laughs> I, Joe. Should, I shouldn't have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's like we always say, oh my god, in Lee Holtz class, we'd always be like, if you want to give the answer, like make eye contact, yeah. but if you don't look down, he'd know when no one wants to answer because we would just be looking down. <laughs> okay, so you guys are ready, yeah? Yeah. Ready. Favorite moment of undergrad? Um, Alex Lee Holtz class. Awesome. What class? Uh, media analysis and criticism. Yes. Um, yeah. He is one of the toughest people um, I've ever had to deal with, and uh, I got a ton of criticism. And then my final paper, all he wrote was, you should go to graduate school at A, and that changed mm. my entire life. Oh, he, was, he writes the best notes, like life-changing notes. I'll just go with an easy one, like, uh, oh yeah, one, a favorite moment was um, playing football in LaGrange, Georgia, and having my family come. Mm-hmm. We won the game, and we were captains, and so it was a big moment in my senior year. Amazing. Yeah. I have two, but I promise they're really quick. Do the it. first, I got my picture on the admissions brochure um, <gasps> at TCMJ, <laughs> which, like you, I started out started out thinking that I wasn't even going to graduate, and then to be like their post, literally their poster <laughs> child, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, second was at, we had a champagne toast at the end. We had something called Senior Week, and the president of our university said, remember, there's a difference between making a living and making a life. Mm. And that, like, I should get a tattoo of that somewhere because that yeah. is just so incredibly impactful to me. On well, next go? week's podcast, Kristen gets a tattoo. <laughs> but actually, I'm trying to get a tattoo next week. Do you want to go? Oh, we'll text. Get <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kristen. Can we do petties after? Yes! No, actually, uh, we're going to talk about this. I'm not kidding. All right. Um, favorite moment at JMU. Sorry, I should have warned you guys. These are, mm-hmm. I call it the speed, not so speed round because these are, like, heavy things you have to think mm-hmm. about. But... I always like to say first thing that comes to your mind. Yeah, I think for me, um, uh, it's, it was a really bad time, but my, but it was so good looking back. Um, my second year of grad school here mm-hmm. was just, just all the stuff I had to go through. It, it was a really rough moment, but it made me so much of a better man mm-hmm. and more resolute in my convictions. So that, that is that is just probably one of my favorite moments I could think of. Okay, I have two again, but I promise they'll be fast. First, meeting my husband. That uh, was just like, yes, uh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> um, and I feel really blessed that we are hashtag JMU. <laughs> we do streamers at your wedding. We grew, yeah, and our um, website was JMI Love You, um, our wedding website. Second, um, I am a fraternity advisor, and in there, when they got their charter, um, I obviously it's not very common that women work with fraternities, and they gave me their sweetheart award, and I got a standing ovation, and there was something just incredibly, like, that be the change moment. I was like, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> Against all odds. So that was really, that's a, a moment I'll never forget. That's true. Awesome. I'll go. So my wife and I grew up on the same street as one another, and I used to pet her dog, but I didn't know her. <laughs> I went to the same high school and the same middle school, but I didn't wow. know her. Um, we were in undergrad together, but this is where we finally got together was because of JMU. So um, uh, so that's, I'll, I gotta do that. That's like, mm-hmm. what's your JMU? best moment? I have to say my daughter being born, and then I have to say my getting married, you know? So <laughs> I gotta do that, get, get that one. But um, at the heart of the question um, is probably, when I was a student, um, I was in British literature cl- in a British literature class with Mark Fagnus, who was retiring. Mm. What? Is that what? Yeah, last semester. Mm. Oh, retiring mm. at the end of the year, um, mm. in a week. Mm. What? Um, oh, and, I and I remember being in this class, and I was always a big dreamer as a kid, which is probably why I was flunking classes because I was dreaming about things I wanted to do rather than things I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> um, and I remember watching Dead Poet Society and like, I want to be like that guy one day. I want to be like Robin Williams, you know? I want to be this guy that just inspires a whole class and gets to yeah. talk about poetry. And in that class, for whatever reason, Mark read um, Omi, or he read When I Heard the Learned Astronomer, and it was a class in the evening, and I walked out, and back then the quad was dimly lit. The quad used to have a lot of IV um, on it, and then it was dimly lit, and then they lit it up now where it's bright. But you could walk out, and you could see the stars and everything. And um, he had read this thing, and it ends with, um, I look up in perfect silence at the stars is the final line of that poem. And um, it's about, like, not just trusting whatever a teacher tells you in class, but like having a personal relationship with the world around you. Oh. And I remember look, go, walking out of class and seeing stars, and I was like, oh my God, I'm in love. I think I'm in love. And that was the first day of class he read this thing. Yeah. And then as the semester went on, I was like, if I could have a dream, I want to be like in this class teaching this stuff one day, but no one would be crazy enough to let me do that. <laughs> like that was not, I was not on a path to do this. And I found myself 
a few years later, well, more than a few years later, in that classroom, teaching that subject, wow. reading Omeo Life, mm-hmm. and, and when I heard the learned astronomer, and then I came in about halfway through the semester, and a kid stood up on his desk and said, hey, Captain, my captain, and I was like, I'm done. I'm going to quit. I, just, yeah. I officially retire. Um, you, you know, that is everything. That's Dead Poet? That is like, he, wow. He did, Dead po- he did the final That's scene awesome. from Dead Poet Society out of the wow. on me. And I was like, I'm done. It's, it, there's, there's no going up from this. It's like, like, with I'm, tears in your eyes, like, do you realize that? Yeah. That's tight. Amazing. That's tight. Okay, so your heart song, it's my favorite question of all time, I'm pretty sure. Um, mm. It's not your favorite song. It's like a song. It's like you mm. as a song. Um, yeah. Mine is um, Come Thou Found My Arm With Every Blessing. This is one of my favorite hymns. The way you look tonight, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> amazing. Just that is so Italian. I love it. I love it. That I is amazing. Love. That's a great song. <laughs> so good. I should have been Or Chris Italian. Brown Forever. What's the second song you said? Chris Brown's Forever. Oh. Um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Uh, I'll go with Such Great Heights, um, the Iron and Wine version. Um, mm-hmm. It's the first song my wife and I danced to at our wedding. Um, Goals for the third time. <laughs> That's all? Yeah, yeah. Iron and Wine is the one that people know. It's the more acoustic version. Mm-hmm. Uh, Postal Service originally sang it. Okay. But we played both. We started with that, and then the last song we played as we walked out was the Postal Service version, which is faster. And yeah. So we walked, I love it. We, we like, left the reception to that. Ooh, song you cry oh to. Or that makes you cry. I, I got it. Make you feel my love, Adele. Mm. Mm. This Adele. Period. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. I'll go with uh, I'll go with Boney Bear's uh, Skinny Love. My daughter was well. We argue about what she was named after, but I say she's named after that album. Um, for, for Emma, forever ago uh, was the title of that album. So my name Emma. My wife says it's for the Austin novel, but <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I hate to be so Christian in here, but I can't. It's my life. Um, it, it's it's a song. Um, it's called um, by Hillsong United. It's called Even When It Hurts, um, and it's a praise song. It moves me to tears every time. Like when I first heard the live version, I like closed my office door and I cried for like, wow. like just a couple of hours, just like nonstop, because it described how I felt in that moment. A good cry. Yeah. Okay, moment you felt most alive. <laughs> Speech. I got it. I actually got it this time. Wow. Yes. Um, yeah. That quick. Um, I mean, first daughter, being, kid being born is the what you hear people say it all the time, but it is the most surreal moment of your life. Mark is right around the corner. Yes, sir. Um, it is the scariest, happiest, most exciting, uh, greatest moment of your life by far, easily. Wow. So that one's there. That one's known. Um, but one that everyone in the room can relate to um, is when I my senior year of college, um, we heard about a meteor shower that was going to be happening, mm-hmm. and so we went to Reddish Knob, and that fast meteor one after the other and then I remember seeing uh, like after an hour or two had gone by we were up there for the whole night um, and I could see this bright just this bright band of things and I was like what is that that's just really cool and I saw this thing like moving you know and then all these things all these things are coming and there were like 300 people and this is pre-cell phone really so no one's playing on their phone no one's playing everyone's just there were like three or four hundred people up there just looking just watching the stars and um, and then I came down off the mountain and um, I was like googling what it was and found out that was the Milky Way band and I was like oh wow it was one of the coolest things and most people wow. will never see that because of light pollution but um, that is for me it was it's what got me interested in astrophysics at the end of my oh, senior year wow. <laughs> and so now I read a lot about astrophysics and um, for fun you were at my moment <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you filmed my moment actually for me Mia so thanks oh my gosh oh my, the moment I literally have felt the most alive in t- my entire life was after I got married walking down the aisle mm-hmm. because we had the DJ play Bruno Mars marry you mm-hmm. and that was I was like just all the stress and the fear of like getting married and it happening mm-hmm. went away and like this is it this is the rest of my life. Like it was my first steps into the rest of my life. Mm. And actually, I have the I have the footage that you took of that moment, and I watch it from time to time because I just look like. Oh, like. Mm. <laughs> I think um, for me, when me and my wife found out we were pregnant, um, we 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 were trying for like a year and a half to get pregnant, and mm. so finally, when that happened, um, like I came home, and um, and she was being weird, and then so like. I, normally when I get home, I gotta just take all my clothes off and put my sweats on. Like I just gotta be comfortable, 
And so I'm doing all that stuff. And she's like, so you're not going to look at the bed? I'm like, why? Why would I look at the bed? Like, the heck? I'm in the middle of a conversation, woman. <laughs> and, um, in there, we bought a, a teddy bear. Um, and that was like a, um, like, a, like, a, like a statement of faith for us to say this will be our daughter's first gift or mm-hmm. our child's first gift. And then reminded me to pray. Um, for for our baby and um, she had a gift there the the bear there with two pregnancy tests and a little note written from my daughter I cried because I, I was like wow like like it like wow I'm gonna be a dad so how do you overcome fear mm, press in Yep, <laughs> lean in. <laughs> yeah, I, yep. I agree. You gotta Amazing. face it head on and and also confess like acknowledge that you're fearful. Mm. Can you wear a professor? Or, in this case, liaison, advisor, <laughs> all the good stuff, mentor. What would you be? Like anything, you in, the like anything, anything, in, the anything in the world. Anything in the world. Anything. Uh, center fielder for the Boston Red Sox. Wow. Hey. I was thinking of the sports, sports one, too. Because that's what it was. It was between those two jobs, and I told the Red Sox that <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like yeah, how yeah. I said Sorry. it. Sorry. Like, oh, if it wasn't this, I would have been. That was my backup plan. <laughs> um... I think I am really excited, and maybe I'm just thinking about this because you're talking about I'm really excited to be a mom. And it's like, not for a while, and not going to, you know, we're taking our time, but like, wow, it's the most rewarding, to me it's the most rewarding job I could ever ask for. So, I'm really excited Um, for that chapter. It is the only event including getting married that like just moved everything else down a level mm-hmm. yeah. I mean getting married was like the coolest thing but it was yeah. still on a level with like seeing the stars and you know cool yeah. stuff like that <laughs> yeah. but that yeah. was just like I immediately looked at my wife I was like who are you you're not even related to me like <laughs> all of a sudden like who is this person in the room yeah, and yeah. I remember this moment and every parent has this moment I looked at my wife and I was like you love Emma more than you love me right she was like oh yeah and I was like cool me too like, yeah. and you realize immediately like there's yeah. nothing that, that compares wow. to that love and feel for your kid yeah I think for me, I would want to, I, literally, I was like, I would want to be like a rich celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, just like. I want to be in your entourage. Yeah, like, like, like you know, it. It. I would be in your entourage. But just somebody yeah. that's like, like, like Beyonce type status, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, the male version of that. Which is not Jay Z, just so you know. Like, somebody that's like, 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 you're like, oh, snap, like, you're him. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. Like, <laughs> 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 I said, I don't want to narrow it to sports or, like, whatever that may be. Just like that. Yeah. Like, in, in renown. Just one name. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, Marcus. just one name. Yeah, like, Marcus. Oh, you know, like, yeah. You're him. You're, you're Marcus. Yeah. Except yeah. I already think you get that on campus, I honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you could win an award for anything, what would you want to win? Ooh. I would want to win, like, a Nobel Prize. Nice. Or, or like a Grammy. I would want to win a Fulbright. So mm. one of the things that I've never, um, the only time I've been out of the country is to go on my honeymoon. We went to Jamaica, mm-hmm. and I oh, always, I sorely regret not sitting abroad when I was an undergrad. I just literally did not know what I was you doing. <laughs> so I think Fulbright's the opportunity to go back and do that mm-hmm. as a grown up. <laughs> um, Oscar for best original screenplay. Ooh. Yes. Okay, who would you think in your acceptance speech? That's the next question. Marcus. Mm. Amazing. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. uh, it would it would definitely be my wife. She would be number one. Uh, Amazing. No doubt. Um, she believes in me more than I believe myself. All I believe myself a lot. People that know me know that. <laughs> I'm like one notch below Trump, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but she she is always like you should do this you should. I mean everything that I've done pretty much she's always like you can do that you can do that I mean and we're both that for each other she's always mm-hmm. full of self doubt and I'm like no you'll win that you'll win that she wins it all the time mm-hmm. um, so um, I, that's important for me yeah, yeah. I would think um, it would be like like either like Jesus or my wife mm-hmm. um, because either one of them would be the reason why I would be getting an award anyway nice I would think my parents, um, so they think that I'm a guidance counselor. It's really funny because I go home and they're like, what do you do again? I could see them saying that. And that's, right, that's, to them, that's like the closest thing. And so I'm like, well, kind of, I guess. Um, But they have made more sacrifices, you know. My dad has worked the same job for 35 years Mm -hmm. to just put me where I am. And they're so selfless. I really struggle a lot Mm -hmm. with, like, not, I'm from New Jersey. And the fact that I haven't decided to move back. And they're just like, you're happy. Like, live your life. Do what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And that's 
that unconditional love is just incredible. So I know Kristen's dad is freaking amazing. <laughs> like I love that man. Like, I, I am <laughs> jealous of the relationship the two of you have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, now I know there's a reason I'm on the center. <laughs> no, 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 it's not like that at all. Like, like I can't I, wait to take you home to my parents. <laughs> I, I, I want to meet him. My mom's gonna be here. You'll be my mom. Um, but yeah, I met you met I met Kristen's dad um, at our at our reception banquet and. I didn't know Kristen had talked to me about talked about me to her parents, mm-hmm. and so I was like, "Hey, what's up, K uh, Sal? What's going on?" And then like her dad and her mom was like, "So this is Marcus?" <laughs> oh my god! And Amazing. I was like, "Yeah." And I was talking to her dad earlier in the line, and so he, and I was like, "We just hit it off." I was like, "Yeah, I like you. you remind me of my dad." And I was oh my like, gosh. Yeah. Okay. Last question, um, and this applies to us three, so it's going to be really interesting. You guys can give a word if you want, but one piece of advice for every college kid going out into the world in one word only in one word only one word only embrace mm. why not mm. ask Ooh. <laughs> try do you have one Mm-mm. me either I haven't really thought about it <laughs> for me it would be embrace or seek Ooh, seek is good yeah so me would be embrace or seek it's very specific, but I say create. Mm. Oh, that's good. I like that. I think mine would be motion. Mm-hmm. Just movement. Mm-hmm. Just movement. get up, go, do. That was more than one word. <laughs> but thank you all so much for taking time out of your afternoon to be here. Thanks and for, for opening up yeah. and sharing stories. And you two for coming out and Got giving it. your input. and. Thank you for doing this. Being here. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait thank to you for yeah. letting us be a part of your story. Real talk. I hope you know that... We will always want to be a part of it. So mm-hmm. this might be this is a, this is a see you later. And as you continue to move forward and do amazing things, we're all gonna be able to cry. <laughs> yeah, but really. I'm gonna really put soft. my cross on. Mine. I'll be gone for the next two hours. I love it. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening, y'all. All right, thank you so, so much to everyone who made this podcast possible. JMU, Student Success Center, Artful Dodger, Pale Fire, my professors and mentors, I love you so, so much. My friends, my parents, and thank you all out there for listening. I hope you learned something new. Maybe you feel good now, like you could take on the world. (laughs) Subscribe for other stories and video content. And if you're listening on YouTube or Facebook, don't forget to leave a comment to answer the takeaway question in the description or respond to any of the topics we talked about today, or even create your own. I promise to read all of them. Finally, find me on Twitter and Instagram at yours truly Mia underscore. Don't forget the underscore. And let's be friends forever. I'm so excited. Thank you again for listening. And remember, the best learning happens inside and outside the classroom. This is the last lap. And until the next podcast series or video or vlog, gotta run. The Last Lap is produced and edited by Mia Brabham, music by Brian Kim.